Second Battalion was placed in reserve again, and this time it appeared we would finally get some much-needed rest. Some of our divisions had been attacking eastward toward the Our, pronounced Ur, River. Patton's tanks had rolled back the entire southern edge of the German bulge and was closing in on beleaguered Bastogne, still held by the now famous 101st Airborne. In Junglinster, Luxembourg, as our company luxuriated in houses apparently abandoned by their owners, we received the wool socks and snowpack boots we'd so desperately needed before. The boots had tall leather tops sewn to a rubber shoe, and they replaced the cumbersome combination of leather combat boots and buckled over shoes. They were not insulated, but they were light and warm with the wool socks, and we were mighty grateful. Wool Eisenhower jackets were also issued, and these fitted under our field jackets for extra warmth. Also making its appearance, and this for the first time in my Army experience, was a liquor ration of six different bottles, or fifths, for each officer. Since I didn't use the stuff except for occasional medicinal purposes, and since I was feeling fine at the time, I called in First Sergeant Nagel and had him split my ration among the NCOs. Some of the officers offered to buy it from me, but I thought they already had enough, and nobody pressed the point, possibly because I was their commanding officer. At this time, Lieutenant Colonel Cannon, who remembered my interrupted R&R &R in Luxembourg City, insisted that I again try to take some time off. Thus, I found myself riding in the lead cab of a three-truck convoy of the battalion's enlisted men, bound not for Luxembourg City, but for gay Paris itself. For some reason, the dream city of almost all GIs. When we arrived at our hotel some 200 tedious miles later, I was surprised to find I was the only officer in the convoy. The duty was real rest and recreation, with no command functions at all for me. The men were simply told at what time and where to report back in three days and were then turned loose on a city the chief wartime industry of which seemed to be women. Well, the G.I.s took off in wild jubilation like a bunch of kids on the last day of school, and I was left to myself, in dignity, sitting on the steps of an old second-class hotel. It was not long before I found out that it is quite possible for an American to be lonely in teeming Paris, the warm and beautiful metropolis of hundreds of small neighborhood villages, sidewalk cafes, fruit and vegetable markets. It was a city with an excitable, war-weary populace. It was dead winter, five long months after the hysterical, emotional tidal wave of the liberation on August 25th, when we were showered with cookies, candy flowers, all sorts of bottles, when we were smothered in kisses and embraces, when men, women, and children screamed and tore about in riotous celebration. Now everything was strictly business, cold and impersonal. I couldn't read or speak the language, and I felt more like an interloper than a triumphant liberator. The liberated weren't above cheating the foreigner, for the few small purchases I made in English-speaking stores and arranged to have sent home to Michigan never arrived. The black market was in full swing, and the price of a dinner in a restaurant was about 25 equivalent to some $75 or $100 today. Nonetheless, I was determined to see the sights and get some variety, even though walking down a snow-swept pavement without having to worry about mines or tree bursts or burp guns was entertainment enough for me. I gaped at the Eiffel Tower. I dutifully inspected the Louvre Notre Dame and other imposing buildings from the outside, for they were still closed to the public. Then I strolled down the Champs-Élysées, from the Place de la Concorde to the Arc de Triomphe and its torch for the unknown soldier of that war to end wars. Standing at that memorial, I felt a bitter irony. I was raised in small towns and in the country, and just as many city boys had never milked a cow, I had never ridden a subway. I was intrigued by the metro, the trains were clean and swift, and they rocketed along in underground tunnels until they eased into a perfectly clean station. Another phenomenon that impressed this country lad was the men's restrooms. It wasn't so much the relatively sanitary conditions prevailing that seemed so unusual to me as the way this was achieved. They were cleaned by women, matrons who came when they pleased, without knocking, and without thinking the least about it. It didn't seem to embarrass the men either for they gave no indication that they even noticed the women. This lack of prudery was more evident on the city's streets, 
where men's relief stations were practically in the open tiny circular brick kiosks around the interior of which urinals spiraled. They were screened in to about shoulder height, but passing women could see the men standing there, and certainly there was no mystery as to what they were doing. Most of the women seemed to pay no attention to the open-air contrivances, which bore the none-too-elegant name of Pissoir, pronounced Pissoir. In fact, some women casually conversed over the barrier as they waited for their companions inside. While I can't imagine any such device in even the worst slums of an American city, I suppose there is a certain modesty in ignoring a natural function instead of calling attention to it by hiding it. Anyway, that was Paris. I got to know the subways better than most Americans as I rode from one station to the next. Every now and then I would get off to window shop. The exploration would have been more pleasant if I had had a French translator along, but I managed to stay out of difficulty, at least until the very end. On one ride I was surprised to find that the train was no longer underground when it stopped. It was dark outside, and I suppose that's why I hadn't noticed our emergence. Everyone got out and walked away, and the train showed no signs of moving on, so I got out to look around and get my bearings. My confusion must have been pretty obvious, particularly with my uniform marking me as a stranger, and soon a very kind lady of about fifty came up and asked in English if I needed any help. I asked if she knew when the subway was going back to town. She smiled sympathetically and told me there would be no more trains until morning, that I had been on the last one. And then she offered to help me find a room and walked me about a block to the only hotel in that part of town. She spoke a few words in French to the manager and then hurried off to her family. Early the next morning, I took the first subway back to the city, grateful that the little misadventure had not come on my last night in town when I would have missed the convoy back to Luxembourg. I never would have lived that down, and no one would have believed what actually happened, and that no French lass was involved. I ate breakfast as soon as I returned to the city, and then I started to wander around town. I did a little shopping. Although I was most certainly minding my own business, I was stopped time and again by the ubiquitous ladies of the moment. While I possessed all the standard male urges, I did not find the propositions particularly tempting. The poor souls were not especially attractive. They looked worn and haggard. Anyway, that too was Paris in all its variety. A few months later, I was to encounter a unique situation in this regard, a situation which came my way in the form of an assignment. One pleasant surprise as I strolled around was a huge American Red Cross sign on a nearby building, and I thought this might be the place to get a cup of coffee and perhaps some suggestions about what to see and do. The suite was nice, clean, and comfortable, and best of all, everyone spoke English. It must not have been much of a lure for the G.I.s, though, because I was the sole visitor. The French Red Cross hostess was a pretty girl with a sweet smile and dulcet voice. We had a pleasant chat on places to visit in the city. After a while, she asked if I'd like to have dinner with an English-speaking French family. When I agreed it might be nice, she told me to come back at six. She would arrange for me to meet a couple who had been educated in the States. I made sure I was punctual, but after waiting in the lobby until almost 7 o'r p.m., I got up to leave. Thereupon, my pretty friend came over and explained that the couple had just phoned to say they had a sick child. They asked her to give me their apologies. She felt responsible for ruining my dinner plans and told me it was too late for me to get back in time for dinner at my own hotel but she said that if I didn't mind waiting another fifteen minutes until she went off duty, she would be glad to guide me to a nearby place that was not dependent on the black market. A little while later, when I saw the big American Officers Club sign on the hotel, she led me to. I understood her maneuvering. I really wasn't too upset. She knew where to get a good meal, and I didn't mind the company. Inside the huge lobby, a group of officers was queued up to buy meal tickets. I joined the line and soon, to my astonishment, got two tickets for only 25 cents each. That was the price officers were usually charged for meals when in garrison, but I didn't expect it to apply in Paris, where everything else was so inflated. With tickets in hand and a young lady at my side, I followed the other officers up a long, magnificent staircase to the dining room. I was flabbergasted and perhaps a little intimidated, 
by the luxury of the immense lobby and mezzanine. I was in for a shock, though, when the second lieutenant posted at the door refused to admit us to the dining room. Improper uniform, he said. Then I noticed that all the officers were in full dress pinks. I was wearing an olive drab uniform with an Eisenhower jacket. Instantly, I grew angry, and I asked if he thought I should go back to the front lines and draw a proper uniform. He was obviously embarrassed and quickly apologized, saying he was partial to the infantry and didn't realize I was fresh out of combat. Rear echelon people sometimes irritate. How can they stand on formalities? How little effort and time it takes to be considerate. As we were ushered to a table, several senior officers glanced our way, but none seemed to object. I couldn't believe the food, having almost forgotten that such lavish, delectable victuals existed. Along with T-bone estiques came mashed potatoes and brown gravy, green beans, rolls, butter, coffee, and pea. I ate very, very slowly and handled the silver water ever so carefully. The club was a wonderland. Although no one nodded or smiled at my pretty young French friend, I realized she must have been in that arena more than once, and I certainly didn't blame her. What did bother me, however, was the kind of life our rear echelon troops, especially the officers, seemed to be leading. My mind took a nasty turn as I saw myself, in sudden fantasy, as commanding general of the area, putting all those fancy people permanently on K rations and sending them up for a tour of frontline duty just so they'd know there was a war somewhere. Ah, daydreams. The young woman and I talked for hours, and I gave her an idea of the realities of the front. She went on at great length about the ordeal of French families during the occupation. Her only brother had been killed by the Germans, and her parents had kept her a virtual prisoner in the house the whole time so the Germans wouldn't see her. She excused herself just before midnight and took a cab home, saying her parents probably were beginning to get worried. We did make a date for lunch at my hotel the next day. Our trucks were due about one o'clock, and I didn't dare miss them. The next day she arrived on time looking fresh and pretty. It was fun watching her order our lunches, with wine, which I'd never had with a meal. I was pleasantly surprised. The arrival of the trucks cut short our luncheon and necessitated very quick farewells. I could only hope, and I did so fervently, that the future would turn out happily for the truly sweet little French woman. She left me with my only really pleasant memory of an interlude in Paris. Our return trip was dismal and dull, if rather noisy. Some of the men were still high on drink and even higher on their memories of conquest. Most of them had indeed broken loose and they could not stop talking about it. According to their unending chatter, they must have been the greatest studs ever on earth. On and on and on. At least the trip had been something of a change for them, and for a while they might not even mind the war so much. The second battalion was still in reserve at Younglinster. Other elements of the 22nd Infantry Regiment had retaken some territory to our northeast along the Sour and our rivers. We heard it had been pretty rough crossing the swollen rivers. Rumors also had it that General Patton himself had come up and personally pushed the attack forward, though I never did find anyone who had actually seen Patton. The German breakthrough had driven a wedge between the 4th Division and the remainder of the 1st Army, so we had been transferred to General Patton's 3rd Army. The general's influence was felt in many ways. Everyone was required to salute, and officers had to wear their insignia of rank at all times. Such civilities stopped, whether Patton knew it or not, the moment we got into action. Even the food, when we were off K rations, seemed better, and certainly we now could get necessities, such as watches, compasses, and field glasses that we hadn't been able to order successfully in the First Army. I recalled my resentment back in September when I had read in Stars and Stripes that Patton had just received ten tons of new maps and aerial photos, while we in the First Army had to struggle with the maps of 1914. I felt that General Hodges, commander of the First Army, was just as good a general as Patton, though he certainly couldn't compete with Patton in charisma. The gains of the First Army in crossing France and Belgium in August and September not to mention the D-Day invasion itself, certainly equaled those of the Third Army. They just didn't seem as spectacular. There were times when we resented all this, 
and yet we certainly all rooted for Patton. Met. We heard Patton was the American general the Germans feared the most, and this we relished. We also heard that he had a very quick temper, and that he instantly replaced officers who did not do what he thought were their jobs, so everyone around him feared him. We also heard that his type of leadership was vital to Allied victory, and for that I think most of us loved Patton. I think the Germans feared Patton because he was very aggressive and unpredictable. He made them worry about what he might do next, so they had to be prepared to defend their lines more carefully than would otherwise have been the case. Near the end of January 1945, the 4th Division headed back northward. Having completed its task of holding what turned out to be the southern flank of the bulge, thus permitting Patton's tanks to go inward behind the flank and then roll straight north to rescue the 101st Airborne in Bastogne. The first day of the trip north was routine convoy. The next day, which was about February 1st, we reached Bastogne itself, though by then all the fighting was over. We, who had done our share of attacking small towns, were nonetheless awed by the total destruction of Bastogne. Everything was leveled except for a few skeletal sidewalls. What had not been knocked flat by artillery had been gutted and hollowed by fire. The dust had not quite settled, and the smoke carried a stench like that of soggy, burning mattresses. The desperate Germans had attacked Bastogne viciously with what must have been overwhelming force. The defenders were shelled with furious barrages from tanks, artillery, and mortars, and as they continued to resist, the Germans were forced to bring up reinforcements needed elsewhere and to reroute panzers away from this vital crossroads near the middle of their breakthrough. Delays would be fatal to the Germans because there were very few days of bad weather to keep Allied planes out of the skies. And the Germans had every military right to success at Bastogne. It was not their fault they'd come upon intrepidly stubborn troops with an indomitable commander, that the rubble from their shelling became breastworks, that the defenders would endure any privations and losses rather than surrender. It was appalling to me to imagine the fighting that must have gone on there. Many bodies still lay where they'd fallen, partly covered by blankets of snow. One long, wide, gradual hillside was strewn with the carcasses of burned-out Sherman tanks and a few German Tiger tanks. Evidently, our losses had been several times greater than those of the enemy, probably because of the powerful 88s mounted on their Tiger tanks. Further on, it seemed that our Air Force had gotten in some good licks, for the fields were littered with the debris of German tanks and trucks. We stopped for the night several miles northeast of Bastogne, and were lucky enough to find a few vacant buildings as shelter against the cold. Standing nearby were several German tanks, apparently abandoned because they were out of gas. They seemed to be undamaged, and even in repose they were fearsome, with those wicked 88 millimeter rifles sticking out ten yards, it seemed. Although the fleeing Krauts had not had time to destroy them, they still might be booby-trapped, and the colonel had warned everyone to keep away. Left to themselves, our men just could not resist those massive souvenirs, and they began to nose around. Some of the bolder ones actually mounted the tanks as crowds of the more cautious gathered around. As some of the curious explored deeper, the inevitable booby traps blew up, killing and wounding several of the more foolhardy men. I was not on top of the scene and was grateful that at least none of my men were victims. The terrain was becoming more and more familiar to me and I realized we were retracing the route we had taken when chasing the Germans over four months before, in September. We learned that our overall mission was to penetrate the Siegfried Line at the very same spot we'd broken through before. We had first taken this sector in the middle of September 1944. Then the 22nd Infantry had moved north to the Bullingen area. From there, in November, we moved north again to the terrible Hürtgen, and then south to Luxembourg, and what turned out to be the Bulge. Now, in late January 1945, we were headed north in December, again. While the campaign maps would show that the 22nd Infantry did indeed, by some curious coincidence, revisit the same sector of the Siegfried several campaigns apart, in truth, it was nowhere near the same 22nd Infantry. Most of the present 22nd were replacements, of the 30-odd officers originally in the 2nd Battalion, I believe only three remained active. Captain Arthur Newcomb, 
Lieutenant Lee Lloyd, and myself. All the others had been killed or wounded. In addition, we had lost many replacement officers over the last five months. We were on the same winding country roads through the lovely town of Hufalis on the way to St. Vith. Back in September, St. Vith had been a very charming little farming town left unmolested by the Germans who had not tried at all to defend it. The only signs of war had been a few scars on buildings from stray rifle bullets. I had been aware of the heavy fighting there during the bulge, but I still was not prepared for my next view of the town. St. Vith was in an open valley, and from the approaches of its southern heights, we got a clear view of its total ruin. All we could see were the jagged outlines of the shattered walls that had once been buildings. It was like a nightmarish, surrealistic painting. Nothing was undamaged, there was no sign of life. This time around, the Germans had made innocent little St. Vith a key supply and communication center, and as soon as the skies cleared, our own bombers had made it a prime target. I hoped that if any natives had still been in town, they had had some warning. Nothing could have survived that bombing. In one area of perhaps 200 square feet, for instance, I counted five huge bomb craters with rubble all around. I was sickened by the destruction. Somewhere among all the debris, some G.I. had found a naked mannequin and placed it alongside the road, where it stood out starkly, ghoulishly. The humor might have been a little sick, but it certainly was a diversion wild enough to cling to the memory. Other units of the army had already driven the Krauts back into the Siegfried pillboxes, so we didn't have to worry about ambush as we rolled along the winding roads from St. Vith in Belgium across the German border into the town of Blyalf. This was something of an excursion compared to my small, motorized combat team that had probed the same paths in September, not knowing what the next turn in the road would bring, and not even knowing exactly where the Siegfried was. One could not help reflecting on the battles we had fought in the same area in September, 1944. We also wondered how many lives had been lost for what appeared to be no gain after almost five months of hell. How far could we have gone if allowed to attack back then? It is easy to second-guess other people's decisions, but the men responsible for the big decisions had a lot to worry about before and after any major campaign. There was also a big difference in the roads themselves. For now, they were solid with ice and snow. The retreating Germans had not had time to plow snow. Their tanks and trucks had just pushed ahead as fast as they could, and there was a six-inch base of ice and compacted snow. Our tanks could negotiate anything but the steepest hills and sharpest curves, and one such obstacle came just east of the hamlet of Buchet, very close to the Siegfried. The rubber treads and steel cleats of the tanks could not get enough traction on the steep inclines and could not make the sharp turns, because in changing direction one tread was braked to become a stationary pivot, while the other tread kept moving. The trouble was that the pivot kept sliding on the ice. The engineers had tried setting off primer cord explosives to break up the ice, but all that did was leave small burn marks. They then sent out a call for extra manpower to dig corrugations that would aid traction, and F Company was elected since we were in reserve. I was told to have my men use their entrenching shovels to chop out small grooves or ditches across the road about every foot of the way. This particular hill was over a half mile long so we were out there hacking away all night. Every now and then we had to take cover against Nabelwerfer shells screaming overhead, but the worst discomfort, aside from fatigue and the cold, was the ice that kept getting chipped up into our faces and the occasional hitting of one's own foot or shin with a shovel. It was a very tough night for us, but at least we had the satisfaction of seeing the tank's tracks biting into the ice trenches and pulling them up that hill before dawn. We were given the next day off, away from the fighting, and we stayed in reserve slightly to the rear. The 22nd Infantry, with its 1st and 3rd Battalions leading the attack, once again sliced through the Siegfried Line at the same spot it had before, just east of Bouquet and slightly north of Branscheid. The infantry advanced by fire and movement supported by artillery and the fire of tanks, and with the use of hand grenades and flamethrowers when the men got close enough. Some pillboxes had grenades dropped down their smokestacks. Others had their apertures blasted by flamethrowers. At least one was plowed under by a bulldozing tank. The Germans never should have started this business. We proved once again that fortifications can be taken.
The 2nd Battalion moved on through our 1st and 3rd Battalions and headed southeast, going into defensive position east of the fortified village of Branshide. This time, in contrast to its frustrating fight in September, the 3rd Battalion swept right into Branshide and took many of the pillboxes from the rear. At that, Branshide was not a joy ride for the 3rd Battalion. For even after they had taken the town and were being relieved after dark by a battalion from the 90th Division, they were hit by a strong counterattack. The Germans swarmed in on top of the normal confusion of men trading places, and soon hand-to-hand -hand combat was taking place in the darkness, with some Americans being killed by others. For a while our troops were afraid to move, but after a time the enemy was sorted out and driven back. Next day, the 1st and 2nd Battalions continued the attack eastward toward Selerischer Ho. Soon we came to the edge of some woods and looked out on a valley and hillside that brought back a frightening recollection to a few of us. This was the place where the German artillery had massacred a battalion back in September. We had been up on the hill on what was now our left front, and we'd been helpless spectators in grandstand seats as the attack battalion had come out of those very woods and swept the Germans before them in what looked like a classic exercise in tank infantry support. It wasn't until they'd gotten way out into the open that the Germans brought down deadly barrages of artillery that tore the attackers apart and finally sent them in stampede back to the woods. To cross the same valley where so many had been casualties, that September wasn't a pleasant prospect, and I was glad that most of our people didn't know its history. We certainly were forewarned, however, and we made sure our men were well spread out and alert to incoming kraut shells. This time, the wet slush and mud prevented us from taking any tanks along, and we were therefore less of a target in the open. We had also heavily shelled the hills ahead before we attacked. We did run into some well-entrenched kraut infantry, but with the help of our artillery, we were able to overrun them, and we made quick work of taking Selleriker Hoi and its roads and ridges. Lieutenant Gesner, the OSS cast-off, really distinguished himself as a good, tough infantryman. He was all over the place, moving his platoon. I saw him using three different weapons, a carbine, an ML rifle, and a Thompson 45 caliber submachine gun. He seemed to be firing a lot more than most officers, and instead of stopping to reload, he'd trade guns with one of his men or pick up a fallen man's weapon. They all thought he was great. One time when he ran out of ammo at the edge of a trench, he jumped in and began to club a German with his rifle butt. The poor German quickly threw his hands up. While at Selleritcher Hoi, we ran into and were victimized by one of the major defects in the Army's generally reliable system of rank and command. The man with the higher rank always gets the nod over one with lower rank, with absolutely no regard for qualifications. This assumes that all promotions are fair and deserved, that all majors are better than all captains, that captains better than first lieutenants, and so on. This procedure is partly excusable in the sense that there's really no way of knowing which man is better qualified until he's tested. The worst part of this system, ironically, was the end to which the entire army effort was pointed, combat itself. In combat, which is what the army is supposed to be about, the testing was quick and conclusive. Yet those who qualified, yes, even survived to be useful, were not quickly promoted even when there were existing vacancies in rank. Thus Captain Newcomb, who was serving so beautifully as battalion exec, which position called for a major, was always in danger of being bumped by an inexperienced new major. This sort of injustice was legion among combat officers, but complaints about it are not the petty, griping they may seem. Experience was a matter of life and death in combat. Anyway, the problem struck us at this time. The Army had lost so many higher-ranking officers in the Hurtgen and in the Bulge that personnel officers scoured the corps of rear echelon and garrison officers and shipped them to the front as infantry replacements instead of promoting qualified men already doing the jobs. This is not to imply the new men were not good people. They simply were not experienced and most of them were deeply embarrassed and uncomfortable at these circumstances beyond their control. So Captain Newcomb was replaced by a major and sent to take command of F Company, and I was reduced to company executive officer, which forced Lieutenant Lee Lloyd down to platoon leader, 
Everyone was unhappy, particularly Lieutenant Colonel Keenan, who was not responsible for the assignments but had to live with their results. But it was a reunion of sorts. For Newcomb, Lloyd, and myself, we'd all been together in the old E Company. Captain Newcomb was very quiet when he arrived to take over command of F. He was the only D-Day officer left in Sake and Battalion, and he had long since deserved a majority. Lloyd and I were a little depressed. In fairness, it is probable that those people who should have been pushing our promotions had been too busy, yet the memory of Colonel Lanham's words, if you survive, I'll promote you, was beginning to irritate. From Selleriker Ho, 2nd Battalion's attack continued eastward, with one of the rifle companies drawing the nasty job of taking Hill 553. Hills were named for their elevation. This hill was directly in the battalion's path to both Obermalen and Niedermalen, and from its height the Germans could control with artillery all the approaches to both towns. In addition to elevation, the Germans also had the advantage of concealment in the two sizable patches of woods near the crest. A few hours before dawn, our attack company went up the open slopes of Hill 553 in full darkness and was lucky enough to surprise the defenders and rout them. Before there was enough light for the company to completely set up their defenses, the Kraut struck back in a furious counterattack led by bellowing SS troops. Our men were quickly thrown back off the hill, though most of them made it back to where they'd started. This misadventure was no fun for the attack company, and it turned out to be even less fun for us, because Captain Newcomb was called to battalion headquarters and ordered to retake Hill 553 at once, in broad daylight. The advance just had to continue, and it couldn't, unless we had that hill. Colonel Cannon gave him the use of tanks and tank destroyers, but said they'd have to stay on the road because the ground was thawing, and the heavy tanks and tank destroyers, TD, might get mired in the mush. Captain Newcomb asked me to go with him to reconnoiter possible approaches, and the two of us walked several hundred yards southeastward along the road from Selleritcher Hoa to Niedermalen. The uphill side of the road was thickly lined with trees, and the banks were high. We were able to move about easily behind this cover, from which we had a good view of Hill 553 and its surroundings. From our concealment, we used field glasses to study 553 and its patches of woods from a distance of about a thousand yards. After a while, Captain Newcomb, the old pro at about 27, veteran of every battle since D-Day, turned to me and said, This looks like the place to jump off from. We can move the tanks and TDs along this road and use them to give us support fire. We discussed using heavy barrages of artillery, but decided to use the direct fire of tanks and TDs as the primary weapon, with the artillery in support. The other attack company had told us about the formidable log bunkers up there, and we figured low-line direct fire would be more effective. <laughs> we brought our men up against the high bank of the road, out of sight of the enemy, and lined up the tanks and TDs along the flat stretches, giving them specific target areas in the patches of woods. They would be firing directly over the heads of our advancing men, and they'd use high explosive shells to keep the Germans undercover while peppering the area with their 30 caliber and 50 caliber machine guns. The artillery FO was also with us, and he had the same targets. Captain Newcomb then had the men spread out widely, and he personally led them out onto the open hill slope as I directed the tanks and TDs to commence firing. The only problem in the beginning was the stunning shock waves from the 75 millennium and 90 millimeter rifles of the armor, as the men were still close in. Many of the men had to sling their rifles so they could get both hands up over their ears. The rolling thunder of the big guns made it impossible to tell whether the enemy was firing back. I could not see any evidence of incoming artillery, <laughs> with Captain Newcomb in the center and the platoon leaders and their platoons spread out to his left and right and behind him. The attack moved in orderly fashion, with everyone walking very fast. I was coordinating the whole show. The crucial decision, for which I was already tensing though I had a few minutes yet, was when to lift the straight line, overhead fire of the tanks and TDs. Artillery was also laying down an intense barrage on the hilltop, but its shells arced in with plenty of clearance of the ground troops and could be lifted later. The tough decision was when to lift the 75s and 90s.
If I stopped the firing too soon, the Germans would rush out of their bunkers and blast our men when they were exposed on the open slope. If I waited too long, I might wipe out my men from the rear. I was sweating, but at least I could clearly see the men and the shell bursts of our 75s and 90s. I watched closely through my binoculars as the advance continued, and I knew the men were scared to death hearing their own shells whip a few feet over their heads while waiting for the enemy to open up. All I could do was watch and worry. It was the first time I'd directed that kind of fire, and I could only hope this was not the first time the armor had done it. I also knew that short rounds cropped up occasionally, and I gave a fleeting worried thought to the workers back in the States who had packed the shell cases. Now and then I put down my field glasses and checked the men directly because I didn't want the magnification to make me think they were closer to the top than they actually were. When I finally gave the command to fire, the barrage was extremely intense and accurate, giving us exactly what we wanted. The Krauts could not come out in that awful blasting. They must have been terrified, strained to the limit of their nerves. Our men continued to walk rapidly up the slope, and I knew they were not getting any return fire because none of them hit the ground. My moment was almost at hand, and I watched closely through my field glasses. When they seemed to be only a hundred yards from the edge of the woods, I couldn't hold out any longer, and I signaled the tanks and TDs to cease firing. The artillery FO then raised his range slightly to clear our men as they reached the edge of the woods. As they got near the bunkers, the infantry was firing from the hip. Most of the Germans were so shaken that they stayed in their shelters. They offered almost no resistance as our men moved in and captured them. Their SS commander tried to get them to fight but was unsuccessful. I made my way quickly up the hill, and when I arrived a few minutes later, everything was completely in our hands and our boys were jubilant. German prisoners were being led out, along with an arrogant SS officer in full-dress uniform and long coat. He was mad as hell, and I only wished I could understand his German sputtering. Captain Newcomb was busy setting up our new defense, so I took over the care of the wounded, of which there were only two. Both were given some first aid. They were then able to walk back to the aid station on their own. Remarkably enough, only a few of the Germans were wounded, a testament to the quality of their bunkers. The sides of those dugouts went down about four feet into the ground and stuck up another two feet, with the dirt from the excavation being piled against the front and on the roof. The walls were logs about 15 inches thick, and they could take anything but a direct hit. The entrance was in the back, and in front were machine gun trenches and communication trenches. Inside, the walls were lined with bunk beds, enough to accommodate eight men comfortably, twelve in a pinch. The attack had been an absolute classic worthy of any textbook on tactics. The advance had been almost a thousand yards uphill across a wide-open slope with close overhead fire support against a strongly entrenched defender. It was my first experience in this kind of precision attack, and I'm not so sure I would have thought of the correct solution all on my own. I hated to think of the losses we might have had if a Green Company commander had had the job. I marveled at the savvy of Captain Newcomb, and while I was as disgusted as he with his demotion, I had to admit it probably had saved a good many lives. All the gratification of this triumph was taken away by one of our discoveries. It seems that after the Germans had retaken the hill with their vicious counterattack earlier in the day, they had taken a small number of prisoners and tied them up with telephone wire, probably for safekeeping. At the outset of our tremendous shelling, the Germans had apparently rushed to their bunkers and abandoned the prisoners. It probably would have been too much to expect a German to risk his life to save a prisoner, and thus some more Americans were killed by their own shells. It was small comfort that only a few were found there. The defense was all set up for the night, and we had just finished our K-ration supper when Captain Newcomb received word from Colonel Keenan to report to battalion for a company commander's meeting. Much to my surprise and some consternation, the captain asked me to go in his place. He should have been flushed and excited from the afternoon's great achievement, but instead he was just quiet and reserved. Never before had I known him to beg off anything at all, but I didn't ask questions. The company runner and I walked back down the hill to Selleriker Ho and battalion headquarters. The moon was bright, 
and the countryside so serene and peaceful that we almost forgot why we were there. We turned right at the road and soon were close to the scattering of buildings that was the hamlet. Several men seemed to be loitering in front of one of the buildings, and they didn't bother to challenge us. This slackness irritated me. As I came closer, all set to ball them out, I realized they were krauts and quickly turned my rifle on them and yelled at them to put their hands up. They did at once, being as surprised as I. I found out later they had been on patrol. They were lost in the darkness and had been too busy talking to recognize us. We took them prisoner. Then, to further ruin my disposition, the guard at battalion headquarters, only fifty yards away, also failed to challenge. I grumbled to Colonel Keenan. He was pretty upset, because almost anyone could have captured his headquarters. One of his staff went right out to check, and I'm sure someone caught hell. The colonel asked briefly about Captain Newcomb, and then got right down to business. The next day, February 8th, F Company was to wait until it was relieved by another company, and then swing down the northeast slope into Obermalen, now controlled by G Company. F and G then were both to attack eastward across the swollen river to the high ground beyond, while another battalion would attack abreast of us on the south side of Hill 553 and go on to take Niedermelon. Captain Newcomb, still somber and very quiet, gave the briefest of routine instructions to the platoon leaders. He then led the forward elements in a wide semicircle to the rear and cut right around to the long, wide slope into Obermelon. Enemy artillery began to pick them up as they reached the edge of town, but most of the men found safe shelter in or behind the buildings. It was my turn with the rear elements of the company, and I pushed them ahead as rapidly as possible over the exposed hillside. The shells soon started to drop in, forcing us to take cover. After each salvo, we got up and moved quickly forward, and we always managed to stay ahead of the next volley. Suddenly the great good luck the almost sensational good fortune that had blessed me for eight months, abruptly left me there on the open road to Obermalen. I clearly heard the whistle of the shell and could tell by its sound that it was falling on me. I threw myself flat on the frozen ground so hard that my chin strap broke and my helmet flew off. At that I had a little luck left, for the shell hit about twenty feet directly in front, with a blast that seemed to split my head. In an instant, I heard the shrapnel whipping past and also got a sledgehammer blow on my left foot. I shuddered with the impact as I lay there, stunned by the concussion. The top of my snowpack had a jagged hole with blood showing, and I wondered if my toes were gone. The whole foot was numb, for which I was thankful. Everyone else seemed okay, so I yelled at the men to keep going and to tell Captain Newcomb I had a slight wound in my foot and would call him from the aid station. Some of them looked a little surprised, but they kept on toward town as I began to limp back to the battalion aid station. I was interestedly watching the medic cut off my boot and expose the wound when I heard Lieutenant Lee Lloyd announce over Colonel Kennan's radio that Lieutenant Wilson had been wounded and Captain Newcomb had been killed. I lay there in tears. I had no idea what the medic was doing to my foot, and I only vaguely heard the colonel fill in Lieutenant Lloyd on the attack plan. Nothing really registered with me. During my months of frontline combat, death was something that came and went. I had lost some very good friends and had had to keep going, but never had the loss been so close and personal. Arthur O. Newcomb was my best friend in the Army, and I'll never forget February 8, 1945. Captain Newcomb was by far the best company commander in combat that I ever knew, though he really didn't look the part. He was short and of slight build, with a sober, unprepossessing personality, but with a quick, dry wit and an exceptionally sharp mind. He took everything in stride, thinking ahead all the time and never giving way to panic. His men and officers grew to love him because, for one thing, they knew that if anyone ever could get them through, it would be Captain Newcomb. Lieutenant Colonel Keenan, who was also terribly unsettled by the tragedy, later observed that Captain Newcomb was of that rare breed that can act and can inspire others to act courageously on a battlefield. He was an exceptionally able, brave, and gallant soldier. It was difficult to imagine any harm coming to him. He was, I believe, an ROTC officer, and he used to talk a lot about the good times he'd had at the University of Wyoming and in the West. 
He also mentioned quite a bit about his family and their sheep ranch in the hills. Sometime later, friends at F Company told me that shelling forced them to take cover in buildings as soon as they had reached Obermalen. Captain Newcomb had been entering a building when a shell hit the doorway. A battle-wise veteran, Captain Newcomb should have taken any cover available. Yet witnesses said he had made no effort to protect himself. The 22nd Infantry Regiment went on a few days later to take the important rail center of Prum, the main mission of that campaign. But of this, I am not able to give a first-hand account. 